everybody, Dimitri here with Cirque Supply, and we're gonna talk about everything after you choose your power system, that is tips and tricks and things that we learned along the way for wiring your cables, your outlets, and your power supply. All right, so before I begin, I wanna apologize for my voice. I'm feeling a little under the weather, but you know, uh, sprinters will feed off of your weakness, so we have to stay strong and keep these videos coming. So let's start with tools. Number one, uh, I'm gonna go over the tools that we carry things we stock, things we use, and why we use them. Uh, let's start with these guys. Wire strippers. Now these guys are, I, I believe people call them automatic wire strippers. You can get them at most any hardware store, Amazon. These guys are really cool because you can change the tension of the teeth and you can use them for thicker kind of double strand conduit wire and things like that. Um, second tool we keep, we don't use it as much, but we keep it on hand is this crimper tool. This is another automatic tool. It's got different color labels for different size crimps. We'll get into the actual crimps we use from WireFi later. But the third tool is gonna be some side cutters. Probably should get some bigger than this. I'll be honest, cutting through 10 gauge wire with these guys sucks really bad. So get something bigger, get something sharp, get something nice. Another tool worth having is something to read the voltage and resistance of your circuits your, and just so you can troubleshoot without having to actually put live currents through stuff or find out what is live and not. Last but not least, I don't have it here, but something like a radiating heat gun um, just so you can shrink your heat shrink safely. You can use a torch or a lighter. I wouldn't recommend it. It can be dangerous and you can melt through the insulation. I'm going to show you how to do it anyway, uh, just assuming the worst, you don't have a heat gun on you. Uh, but without further ado, let's dig into some of the wiring uh, connectors and hardware we use. Now, I'll show some close-up shots of all these for you guys, but to start this off strong, we're gonna go with our favorite connectors in the world. These are called Wagos or Wagos. Not quite sure what they're called. Leave me alone. I don't know what it's called, but these guys are revolutionary. You just shove your wire in one end, close your clamp and your wiring is finished. Boy, do I love them. Um, we use doubles like this. We use triples, quads, fives. I think we can go up to nine. Probably wouldn't recommend it. At that point, you've got something else going on, but it uh, helps you splice into circuits very easily. Uh, it helps you connect things without um, having to permanently connect them. And yeah, I'd recommend getting a bunch of those, at least doubles and triples. Next thing you wanna keep stocked up on are zip ties. We go through a lot of zip ties. Now we'll zip tie temporarily as we work through the van and then we'll do zip ties for permanent fixing later, but you're gonna use a whole lot of these and those wimpy little side cutters are gonna come in handy for the zip ties. And uh, along with zip ties go electrical tape. This is another one of those small pieces. Uh, we don't actually use a lot of it, but it's handy when you have um, wires you're gonna feed through and you don't want live ends zapping, shorting out on each other. Keep electrical tape handy. Now this next part is the most important part of the video. I'd say the most critical part of the video and that's going to be the wiring you use. Now, if you go online and you start checking out what size wiring you need using general wiring calculators, you're gonna realize one thing. Oh my God, why do I need such big wire for such a small circuit? You don't. If you choose the right wire, you don't have to go through all that mess. And so we use every, every single wire we purchase is a marine grade wire that falls under ABYC compliance. It's something, something, boat, yacht, something, something. Let me preface by saying I'm not an electrician. So take everything you see here with a grain of salt. These are just what the professionals told us to use and it's been working very well for us um, in the long run. But the short of it is this wire isn't just like your normal stranded wire. This is actually tinned and braided so it's able to handle much higher loads than standard wire. So we're able to power things using mostly 12 or 14 gauge for 12 volt DC, whereas we would have to go much thicker if we're using standard residential wire. So avoid going to Home Depot or Lowe's and buying that standard residential wiring. You don't wanna use it. Spend the money, get something marine grade, something that's insulated, tinned and braided. It's going to save you a lot of trouble, headache and liability in the future. Here at Cirque Supply, we're a little bit anal about redundancy. We talk about it all the time when we train upfitters. We're very much pressing on the point of safety and being redundant. And I want to talk to you a little bit about that today. Now, whether you're using an EcoFlow, Victron, or Energy System, the first form of redundancy we'd always recommend is putting a fuse between your actual power system and your DC-DC charging. I think it's 
general practice or good practice not to put those cables directly to your vehicle with no form of redundancy. We do EcoFlow for nearly all of our builds and we put a 100 amp breaker between the actual battery and the EcoFlow system for our stuff. You don't have to do the same. This is just a recommendation. You could consult a professional to get their opinion, but just generally good idea, good practice. Second form of redundancy is going to be protecting your cables. Now, if you've ever taken your wall off in your house or been in your attic, you've probably seen a whole lot of these white cables floating around. And in a house, it's probably fine because houses generally don't move. But a van moves, and a van moves a lot. And to make matters worse, most of what you're rubbing up against is bare metal or metal with a very thin layer of paint on it. Now, a van that's moving all the time plus rubber insulated wire, if you basically play rock, paper, scissors against rubber and rock or rubber and metal, uh, the rubber's gonna lose. It's gonna vibrate and it's gonna eat through that outer insulating layer and it's going to cause you problems. Maybe not immediately, maybe not a month down the road, maybe not even a year down the road, but eventually you're gonna have issues. So the first layer of protection out of the three that we go for all wiring is gonna be this outer insulating layer. Later, layer. If you're buying marine grade wire, you're gonna have it on anyway. So you don't really need to worry about that. The second layer is going to be a wire loom. Now it's kind of hard to see because this is very thin wire loom. This is what we use for all of our wiring, um, I guess, 16 gauge and up. Uh, but this is from Alex Tech. It is an expanding sleeve wire loom. I would avoid the open slit wire loom. It's kind of a nightmare to feed through. These guys, you can kind of just Chinese finger trap your way through your wires. That's the second layer of redundancy. And the third layer of redundancy, I don't actually have here to show you, but it's inside the van. Anytime your wire and your loom are touching anything metal, you want something there. Now we use something kind of like trim lock that you would use for windows, but it's much smaller and it's made to fit sheet metal. And we'll put the trim lock around any edges that wire is touching. Or if you're making holes in the van, we put a rubber grommet with rust coating on the hole, obviously. That's gonna be the third layer of redundancy for our wiring. Okay, so I've got a collection of tools here. I'm gonna quickly show you how we prepare wire. Um, now, we have a state-of-the-art system for measuring out our wire. If we know we need 15 feet and I've got uh, six foot height, my wingspan from you know, hand to hand is gonna be around six feet. So I'll quite literally just stretch this across my body. There's six, do it twice, now I've got 12, and then from my fingertips to my chest is gonna be three feet. Wow, look at that, we've got 15 feet. That process, we don't make it precise, um, especially when using high-end wire like this, it's not gonna make too big of a difference, but let's just make an arbitrary wire cut here. That's the wire length we need, and I'm gonna kinda walk you through how we would prepare this wire as if we were using it on our own build. So, to start, I would take my wire loom, Compress it or pinch it a little bit to get it open. These things, when they're fresh, are kind of a pain. Get it started, and that whole Chinese finger trap joke I made earlier, that's where that comes in. I'm gonna go ahead and feed this loom onto this wire. Nothing crazy. And then I like to leave anywhere from, you know, four to six inches. Oh, got a bit of a tangle here. Let's undo this. I like to leave anywhere from four to six inches of wire left. So I'm gonna keep going a little bit. A little bit more. There we go. That lets me cut this tail end right at the end. And then it lets me feed this on and have plenty of real estate to work with on both ends. So, voila. Uh, the next thing we're gonna want is our heat shrink. I'm gonna cut this out of frame here for a sec. There we go. One, you know, the length of the heat shrink doesn't really matter. I tend to be a little aggressive with my heat shrink, so I will cut more than I need, but uh, we'll pinch this and we'll go ahead and feed our heat shrink over the wire loom. I like to twist as I go, it tends to not get caught as easily. And then I've got heat shrink on one end. And now I have got heat shrink on the other. I'll pull it past and then just pull it back. All right, so here we are. Got our wires, we've got our heat shrink. It's overlapping the loom and the wire to keep it all nice and enclosed. I'm gonna head over there real quick and use the heat gun, get this thing shrunk, and I'll be right back. So I know we've already got our wire ready to go, but I just wanted to quickly show you these tools here. This guy, super simple. You can adjust this screw here to get more or less tension on there, and uh, we tend to use this fast. Just put your wire where it needs to go. Bam, look at that, popped it right open. I've got no scarring, I've got no damage to the wire itself. And then I'm ready to feed the tips of the wire and get exactly as much as I need off of it. It's really super convenient, really nice tool. 
Um, the actual crimping tool, not much to show here. The only tip I'd give is put your actual fittings inside of the tool first. So just kind of crank it down until it barely holds the fitting and then put your wire through and then crimp it. And we like to hit it twice with the same color. Notice there's yellow, blue, and red that kind of go with the corresponding color. Super simple. And that generally shows you how to use these two tools. Um, again, if this hasn't made you a believer yet, nothing will. This is the best tool that you can get for the job. It's gonna save you a lot of time. I'd recommend getting one as soon as you can. So you might be asking yourself, okay, I get where I need to use spades, I get where I need to use wagos, but where would I need the triples? And uh, 110 wiring is the best case scenario for us to use these, and it's what we usually use them in, and I'll explain why. When we're running power over the driver's side to the passenger side, we want to avoid running a bunch of wires or like an excessive number of wires. So we'll run one main wire. Usually all of our plugs are 15 amp, but the EcoFlow has a 30 amp fuse. And so what we'll do is we'll run all of these over to an outlet on the passenger side, and then we'll splice off of that to power another outlet. Now, I'm going to put this on real quick for you and show you what I mean. So I've got a triple connector on each of my WAGOs now. And what that does is assuming that this is the power in line, I can now take our outlet wire for the first outlet and plug it into the second port on each of these. And then I can take the power out for the other outlet onto the third port and I close these all down. And now I have very easily and successfully spliced into that wire without having to put a bunch of forks on the back of that outlet. Those little conduit boxes are way too big for most fans, especially like the residential size ones. And if you're gonna get the inch and a half deep, low profile conduit boxes to protect your wire, good luck getting six strands in and out of that thing. So this just makes it easier. Something I recommend picking up and uh, hopefully it saves you some time. Anyway, I hope you guys enjoyed this video, found these tips and tricks useful. If you're curious about any of the parts here, please reach out to us or leave us a comment below. And as always, thanks for watching and happy building.